الله أكبر الله أكبر Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the Islamic Center at New York University podcast coming to you straight from the heart of New York City. We're building an amazing Muslim community here at ICNYU where everyone is welcomed and respected no matter where you're from or where you're at. This is the place to be. So open your ears and your heart and come along with us on another life-changing journey. Bismillah. ونشهد ان سيدنا مولانا محمدا عبده ورسوله In the name of Allah the gracious the merciful all praise is due to Allah the Lord of the universe the master of the day of judgment I bear witness and testimony to the oneness of Allah to his magnificence his omnipotence his might his glory to his being the creator and sustainer of all things the giver of life the guider of hearts, the master of the day of judgment. And I bear witness to the fact that Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is a servant and final messenger. May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him and upon all those who choose to tread in his path until the last day. Over the last weeks we've been looking at a particular category of individual that Allah Zawajal mentions in Surah Al-Furqan, the 25th chapter of his book, that are known as the Ibad al-Rahman, may Allah make us from amongst them. We've looked at about 10 or so different characteristics that identify this unique set of individuals who not only embrace being from the Ibad of Allah, but in particular have a unique relationship in that their sense of servitude is connected deeply to his being Ar-Rahman, the most merciful of those who show mercy. These characteristics that we've looked at so far have gone in various directions. At the Ibad Ar-Rahman, Allah Azawajal, he says, they walk on the earth with grace and dignity. And then when the jahilun engage them, speak to them, they simply say salam, qalu salama, they respond with peace. They spend a portion of the night for their Lord in prostration and in standing. They made dua to Allah for protection from Jahannam. They engage in spending of their wealth with no extravagance or miserliness, but they give in a way that is of the middle path. They don't call upon any other than Allah. They do not kill indiscriminately, commit murder. They do not engage in zina. They turn back to the divine and are willing to admit mistakes that they have made. And as the verses they continue, Allah Zawajal in describing this unique group of people, the Ibad al-Rahman, he says, وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَشْهَدُونَ الزُّورِ That they're the ones who, they don't bear witness to Azur. وَإِذَا مَرُوا بِاللَّغْوِ مَرُوا كِرَامًا and when they happen to pass by that which is love, they do so also with a sense of nobility. There's two words here that we want to be able to extrapolate meaning from. The word zur and the word love. In the first part of this, we get yet another characteristic that they don't bear witness to a zur, which is identified as falsehood, but anything and everything that is within this category is embodied in this verse. Ours is a tradition that is not about you sit still and do nothing, but embedded within it is a notion that this legalistic framework that many of us are given is complemented with a robust theology that gives us something to believe in. Islam is not just do's and don'ts and rights and wrongs. 
You have practice, ritual, your prayers, your fasting, your charity, your pilgrimage. But essentially, Islam gives you something to do, undoubtedly. But it also provides for you a structure that's rooted in conviction, a belief in a divine entity that is a God of everything. Inclusive of people that look like you, people who don't look like you, people who dress like you, people who don't dress like you, people who eat like you, who don't eat like you, who have as much money as you or not as much money as you or way more money than you. People that come from every culture, every race, every class, every ethnicity. A God that is a God of all of those people. And a belief in so much more. But just like Islam gives you something to do, it gives you something to believe in. We have a third dimension that goes in our tradition that's called Ihsan. That our Prophet Sallallahu defines and identifies as that you worship God as if you see him. So you understand although you cannot see him, he can see you. So you have a religion that gives you something to do, something to believe in, and now it gives you something to embody. The idea is not that it's just simply rooted in externals. You are not Muslim as an identity variable, nor because you were born into it, but it's something that you practice. It has an active mode of engagement, and it's meant to be transformative of the world around you because it transforms the world within you. And this verse now gives us a deep imperative to recognize that the Ibad rahman they don't bear witness to falsehood. That of the essential values of this religion is honesty, integrity, truthfulness. The Ibad rahman they're not in a sphere where they live in contradiction of that. May Allah make us from amongst them. This word zuhr, it's something that the Prophet Sallallahu identifies a deep detest for. We have a hadith where a companion asked the Prophet Sallallahu what are the worst things that a person can do? And there's a lot of different hadith that follow this construct. What are the best actions? What are the worst actions? And there's distinct responses that we get in different narrations. In this particular narration, the Prophet is asked while he is lying down. And his first response is that you commit shirk, you associate partners with Allah. It's the worst thing you could do. May Allah protect us from it. And he's asked then what? And he says that you have disobedience to your parents. And then he's asked then what? And now he goes from lying down to sitting up. He changes his composure. And he says, Shahadat Azur, Waqawl Azur. They're giving false testimony and speaking falsehood. And the Hadith says he keeps saying it again and again and again. Giving false testimony and speaking falsehood. Giving false testimony and speaking falsehood. Giving false testimony and speaking falsehood. The companions who are hearing it, they say we wish he would have stopped saying it. It wasn't a joke that your prophet, he was known as Al Amin, the trustworthy one, before he was even known as Nabi. We have a religion that is deeply rooted in an ethical framework. You can't be a good Muslim if you lie. That's just a fundamental truth that you have to embrace. Whether you align to someone else, you align to yourself. You spend yourself in a place where the falsehood just comes and comes and comes. And it's not just about the denial of what is negative, but the embracing of what is positive. That you want to speak truth and you want to see truth. You want to be a person of equity and justice. The word zur, they say, the mufassirin, that it can firstly refer to something of shirk. That this is a Meccan surah, and it's coming down to a Meccan people. And they're being told that the Ibad al-Rahman, they do not bear witness 
to this idea of anything other than Tawheed. There's one God, that's it. But then with specificity, it starts to give us more definitions. We talked about shirk in the last verse. We, the Ibad rahman they do not call on other than Allah. The Shahada Tazur is a second interpretation, the literal bearing of false testimony. Whether that's in a state of jurisdiction, a court setting, or even just in individual interactions. That you know somebody did something, but you still say otherwise. It doesn't matter if that's your friend, your family member. It doesn't matter if that's somebody who was doing something else for you. There's not a transition when it has to deal with somebody else's rights. You are not in a place where you get to barter somebody else's rights. You know that guy that is your friend mistreats women? Don't go around saying that he doesn't. You know your family member is not somebody somebody should be in business with. You know that that person is not someone that someone should get married to. You know that they have repeated behavior of not honoring the rights of others. You do not bear false testimony in a moment like that. The Ibad rahman they are not even coming close to it. Shahad al Somebody asks you, you're not in a place where your priority is to cover somebody's back for something that is problematic. We had the difficult news of a sister in Chicago by the name of Sanya Khan, whose ex-husband came all the way from Georgia to Chicago, killed her in her own home, before taking his own life. And this is a community that as a collective supports and believes survivors. Individually, if you're not there, then you got to get on the same page. But that reality does not happen to somebody as the first instance or sign or indication of something. But it comes from repeated excuses being made for someone who no excuse should be made for. Repetitive justifications, creating neutrality where there's no neutrality. Being able to justify, validate, give all kinds of things. And the reality of this verse coupled with the others, is that it's not just consequential in and of itself to the one person who should not ever have to be in fear for their existence. <coughs> Are you going to stand in front of God <coughs> having uttered those words that somehow validated and justified what you knew was not true? The Shahada Tazur is not something to take lightly. When you are given the honor of bearing witness, you bear witness with what is actual, not what is convenient, not what will give you gain in the dunya. And the Ibad rahman they don't play games. They understand religion is not just about, look at how great I am because I stand and I bow and I prostrate. But it's a means to something. That azur, beyond testimony and witness, refers to, they say also, just falsehood, lying in any capacity. And the juncture of life that most of us are in right now, we're not five years old, man. My six-year-old who was sitting with me here last week, he's innocent. He doesn't know half of the things that come out of his mouth half the time. His nine-year-old sister, she's grown a little more than him, but she's still growing. 
where you sit in this phase of your existence is the subjective decision to be able to determine what kind of person do I actually want to be. And to have a difficult conversation that reflects on this concept introspectively. Why do I lie about the things that I lie about? It's different from false testimony. But individually, you spend from the day's start till the day's end, engaged in conversation and discussion. Sometimes it's because we're scared. We don't want people to know the mistakes that we've made. That fear is real. We don't know how to deal with consequences, punishment. We're worried that there's something that will come after. To not remove the prism of right and wrong, but to be able to understand from our own individual socialization what brings me back to this place. The Prophet describes the munafiq and gives traits. When they speak, they lie. When they make a promise, they break it. And when they're entrusted, they break that trust. You literally have a Prophet who had adversaries that sought to kill him. And they still entrusted him with things, jewels, possessions, objects that he would look after. And despite the transition in relationships, he still honors the trust that they have with him. That's why I follow my prophet. Because no one can doubt his character, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. No one can doubt the integrity of his heart. He's an honest, good man without any ambiguity to it whatsoever. You start to trickle down. What are the silly things that I tell lies about? What am I really giving up metaphysically at the end of it? That zul, it refers to lying in that way. And then fourthly, the Mufassirin, they say it's just in reference to anything immoral. And the way that the Shahada Tazur becomes a part of it is that you're not witnessing, you're not in the presence, in gatherings where things that are happening that are deeply absent of ethics. You don't frequent spaces where the haram is just in abundance. And that's not just the consumption of alcohol, the committing of zina, or any of these things. But you're not sitting in gatherings where people are purposefully building inequitous, unjust systems. You don't frequent gatherings and spaces and make justifications for professional ambitions that might give you money in your pocket, but your risk is from Allah to begin with. And consequently, it then yields for somebody else that they are held down and oppressed. You don't sit in gatherings that demean and objectify your sisters. You don't sit in gatherings where people speak poorly of others, gossip, lying, backbiting, slandering. The recognition of what it is that is without a sense of ethics. Your eyes will not be in a place, your ears will not be in a place. The Ibad rahman when they stand in front of Allah, that when those limbs speak about what they heard, what they saw, that there was anything of azur amongst it. You have everybody just move up again and come in close. You got to think about it as a process. This is about justice, creating equity and balance. When you sit in the gathering where people might validate that it's harmless fun, we mock, we ridicule, we joke, it starts to create a perspective for you 
of how you view those that are different. The mocking, the joking, the ridiculing it starts to now shape for you a prism, a perspective of how you see the world. It creates now an opportunity as things move forward to be able to build through that mocking, that ridiculing, narrative that is now rooted in demeaning and oppressing. It then crafts and creates now for us on a broader level subjugation of individuals based off of their race, their ethnicity. This is what people have done to us. A war on drugs cannot be called a war on black people, but that's what it is. And you get politicians that stand up and utilize terms like predator and thug. TV shows like cops that have white men in blue uniforms arresting black people on national television to reinforce stereotypes. Crack cocaine floods neighborhoods. Nobody asks where it came from in the first place. And then hundreds of thousands in the immediate and millions over time. Of black families have their lives disrupted. The prison industrial complex gets created. That's why a joke is not simply just something harmless. Ibad al-Rahman, they wouldn't stand for it for even a second. The war on terror doesn't build itself out any different. They can't call it a war on Muslims. Islamists, jihadists, fundamentalists, terrorists, television shows like 24 and Homeland that have you in a sphere of existence that says that if I'm given something that I was entitled to in the first place, I have to somehow be grateful for it. So you want to perpetuate it. You don't want your eyes to say, that I get distracted by these foolish gatherings that I spent my time in saying that I had to be there because that's how I get a job. I have to be there because that's how I will fulfill for myself. You validate someone else being able to then create precedent to hold it against somebody who wants a different. So the Ibad al-Rahman, they don't bear witness to Azul. That's a characteristic that you want to aspire towards, especially in this day and age. Everything is about imbalance. How do I get mine and take as much as I need and even more than I have to have, even if it means you don't have to have so much? And as the verse continues, that if they happen to pass by something that is vain, futile, abhorrent in its talk, they walk by with a sense of being kareem. Ibn Mas'ud, he is said to walk by a gathering that is absurd. He comes upon it by chance. And why it's translated as if they happen to, because it's not purposeful. You come upon a space and you see people and all they're doing is speaking bad about others. They're gossiping, straight up ghibah. It's haram, don't do it. The Ibad rahman they come upon this kind of gathering they didn't know that this is what it was. They definitely don't sit down and start to join in. But they also don't allow for themselves to maintain presence in it. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, when he comes upon such a gathering, he simply just removes himself from it. And this is what it's to be kareem. It's generous, it's noble, elevated, because it's not arrogant. He doesn't walk away and then he just recreates and perpetuates the vice that was there. 
Does it go to other companions and say, man, you know what I just saw those guys doing? Elevating himself by denigrating somebody. It's not judgmental. It's not something that seeks to push others down so you could bring yourself up. That's not being kareem. But you know, this isn't the space for me. I'm just going to move away from it. When the Prophet sallallahu finds out this happens, he says, today, Ibn Mas'ud, he became Kareem. It's not easy. But you want to think about it from a few different places. One, don't use your tongue to hurt people. That's not why Allah gave it to you. The gains that you yield, they have diminishing returns to them, both in a worldly and otherworldly sense. The literal consequence of the engagement of gossip is that when you speak about someone behind their back in a way that they would not want you to, there's a transference now of your good deeds to their accounts. And you want to understand this as a principle, that the day of judgment is real. May Allah grant us ease on it. And I don't know about you, but I haven't lived such a life that I can just dole out the limited good actions that I have for a moment of temporary satisfaction. Hassan al-Basri, rahimahullah, when he found out people used to speak about him and gossip, he would send them gifts. And he'd write letters in the gifts to say, thank you for the benefits of your good deeds on the day of judgment. I'll relish in having them in my account. And when people would accuse him of speaking about them in their absence, he would say, who do you think you are that I would give you the benefit of my good deeds? And I'm hurting a lot of people. There's a link between the two. The Shahada the Zur, every time you hit that button on social media, you are bearing witness to it, whether you are conscious of it or not. You come across something and you give it more life without verifying, validating. You continue to spread the information you have now become a part of the process. You are now bearing witness to it. It is in your account that you pushed it forward. The distinction in our tradition, legalistically, between ghiba and namima, gossip and slander, is that gossip has truth to it. Namima is when you're just making stuff up. Just think, fundamentally, think. You think that's why God gave you the ability to speak? Can you show me a hadith where the Prophet وسلم, is speaking poorly about someone in these ways? Gossiping. It's not that you sit and you twist it. Someone is oppressive, you do not cover it for them. That's not what this is saying. Someone is abusive. You don't manipulate text to say you're not supposed to reveal somebody's sins. The craziest thing, man, is if you're sitting down talking with somebody about somebody else, most definitely they are sitting and talking about you with somebody else also. You start to rope it in. You get it in check. The Ibad rahman the ones who are the servants of the most merciful, they don't engage in this kind of behavior. As a process, it might not be easy. But you start to give indication where you can have aspiration. You're sitting in a space with somebody, there's still wisdom, there's still mindfulness. Don't you perpetuate it. What do I do now? 
I'm sitting and the person who is sitting across from me is somebody who I can't just get up and walk away from. That's my mom. That's my dad. That's my grandmother. The opportunity to bear expression works within the specificity of your circumstance. The hadith that says if you have the ability to change it with your hand, then do so. And if you can't, you speak. And if you can't, then you make du'a for that thing. <laughs> it finds its presence in these circumstances as well. So with compassion and care, you're sitting down with your best friend and nonsense is just spewing out of their mouth. Let them know that this isn't what you're about, not just for your sake, but for their sake. You steer the conversation with compassion to just bring up something else if you're not in a place where you can deliberately and explicitly say it. And if you sit in this gathering, be open to the idea that it's something that you do. Shaitan's biggest trick is going to get you to believe that you don't tell lies, that you don't spread gossip, that this is something that's not me. And you throw your back against the wall and start to defend yourself. And for a moment of protecting the nafs, the ego, you're creating an opportunity to hurt your heart for eternal existence. It's not worth it. You have to assess it for yourself as a particular value. It's not that my value is honesty. My value is that I am honest. That's what I want to be. I don't think integrity is important, but I want to be a person of integrity. How you submit to language is important. Nobody's going to walk on the street, and if you ask them, is being nice good? Everybody's going to say, yes, it's good. You got to make a transition that now holds yourself accountable. So there's a reflection. I want you to just think about this deeply. We have a prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who literally would walk into a room and people who were not even of his community would just rejoice. As-sadiq al-ameen, radina, radina. Rejoice, rejoice, the trustworthy one is here. Now, most of the time when any of us open our mouths, nobody believes a word that we say. I don't believe you're going to hold your promise. I need a lot more than just two witnesses to a contract to cover my bases because any which way you could wrong me, you're going to try to take advantage of me for it. I have to be careful about what I say in front of you because I don't know what you're going to go and say to somebody else. Why would you want to be like that? Why would you want to be known in that way? You put all these verses together that we've been looking at. You start to think about them. They don't have time to be spending themselves in gatherings that make no sense because they're using the night to engage in prostration to Allah. They're the ones that are making du'a to Allah, saying, Ya Allah, steer us away from the adab of Jahannam. They don't have time to be in other people's business. There's a recognition back to the self. And in a world where most of us right now, if we ask every single person in this room, have you ever heard somebody gossip before? Have you ever heard somebody backbite before? Have you ever heard somebody lie before? Have you ever seen somebody break a promise or been on the receiving end of any of those things? There's a lot of hurt in the world. So use the gifts that you've been endowed with to go out and to be a source of mercy, a source of love, a source of light. 
You don't run back to Dunya at the end of Juma. You turn to the people that you pray with for five, ten minutes, and you say to them, how are you today? You check in on others. You use the gift of speech to be able to give people a sense of upliftment. You allow for yourself to just think deeply. What is this all about? Am I getting done what I have the ability to get done? Am I going to be a person that just lives in pursuit of moments for the rest of my life? Not realizing then until when those last moments come, why did I do what I did? Why did I spend as much time in the places I went to? Why did I spend as much time speaking in the ways that I did? Why didn't I use my voice when I had the ability to? So you go home and read these verses of Surah Al-Furqan. Be in a place where you're open to the idea that every day is another opportunity to reach your potential best. Recognize through this that you implement on the characteristics, but also understand that there are so many people in the world right now who are recipient of actions from those who are other than what these characteristics call to. So the world is right now filled with people who have to deal with the consequences of false testimony. The prisons are filled with people who should not be there. Every day, you hear about another person, 30 years in a prison, who they found to be innocent. So you want to be the lawyer who dedicates their lives to being able to help others in that way. that gets them what they deserve. The financier that puts their money behind these kinds of projects. You think about the other characteristics of the Ibad rahman that they don't spend in extravagance, they're not miserly, but they're helping to be in a place where balance is restored. It starts with just thinking from here and thinking from here. What is this religion really about? Why was it given to me? And how do I start to take it for everything that it's guiding me towards? that are my choices at the end of the day. You decide your decisions. If you want to spend tonight speaking poorly about somebody, that's on you. As your brother who loves you, don't do it, man. Don't give life to falsehood. Give life to light. Give life to love. Give life to things that are rooted in real ethics. But in this characteristic, Allah is telling us, through this verse, the Ibad Rahman, they don't bear witness to falsehood. And there are those that when they come upon something that is futile, vain, ugly in its discourse, they simply just move away from it with a sense of dignity, a sense of honor, a sense of respect. May Allah make us from amongst them. فقولوا قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين فاستغفروا إنه هو الغفور الرحيم إن الحمد لله إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله تعالى فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن سيدنا مولانا محمدا عبده ورسوله Last week, for those who were here, we had asked the Jama'ah to help support a family who was in need. And we needed to raise about $1,500 to $2,000 to help them with some immediate bills. 
This is the first time in years that we've asked people at Juma because we haven't had Juma for so long because of the pandemic. As we come back to gather, we gather now and opportunities arise that we are going to be doing for a first time in a long time ongoing as we get acclimated again to just being in this type of space. I was worried that we wouldn't be able to get there because before COVID, there used to be 800 people that would come to Jemai in this space. And now we get about 200, 250. It wasn't 800 in this room, but about four or 500 here. And then we live stream downstairs. And prior to whenever we would ask, we would always hit the number that we needed, mashallah. Last week, I didn't know what we were going to do, and we needed to raise about $2,000, and alhamdulillah, we raised about $3,600 for that family, from a quarter of the size of the people attending, with so many of you coming to me after, saying, I don't even have cash on me, but I want to give. Can I Venmo? Can I do this and do that? I want to share that with you, firstly, because... I'm very proud of this community. One of the greatest blessings that we derive Baraka from is through this characteristic of being kareem, being generous. The opportunity to be able to serve a community like this is not what many people are afforded. A lot of my friends and colleagues who do what I do, they're constantly in a place where they're just getting hated on by the people that they serve boards that can find them, people who don't express gratitude. I want to make it easy for them. But every day I'm blessed to wake up with excitement because I know that these people in this space, they're about trying to get things done. So may Allah make you a continued source of benefit and make us a community that is always willing to give to others more than what we give to ourselves. It's a beautiful characteristic. And the second reason I share it with you is that that's something that happens together. And when you can recognize the ability as a collective to find strength, just think of what we could do if all of you knew each other's names. That if all of you start to spend meaningful time together beyond the day of Jamaa, you prayed other prayers together. You came to learn together. You ate together. If in five minutes, 200 of us can achieve that, this is a community that serves 10,000 people. You just connected at a deeper level. And I share this with you for another reason that there's some of us here who those last months have been the first time we've ever been in this space. And there's some of us who have been here for many years. But I've heard from so many, those who are new, as well as those who have been coming here for a long time, that it still feels like it's their first time because there's so many new faces. <laughs> so you take some opportunity to talk to the people who you don't know. Engage them interact with them. It's not easy when you get to this demographic to have the energy to say, I gotta make new friends. But even if you're not trying to be friends with somebody, there's people next to you who you don't even know who they are and they could be your greatest asset in building what this world needs right now. So if in five minutes we can help a family a mother who sent me a message that I wish I could share with you, where she's making to offer each and every one of you. Just imagine what you could build if you knew each other a little bit more deeply, the ones that you don't know. That's what we want to start to get back to. So try today, the end of Juma before you leave, to just find somebody, talk to them, turn around, ask them their names. If we were allowed to do that during the Jummah prayer, I'd make you do it right now and I'd make you do it every week. But it doesn't mean you can't do it on your own volition. You'll see what it is that will have the ability to continue to achieve, mashallah. I'm so proud of you. I'm so grateful. 
that we have this blessing of being able to help other people and not let them feel as if they're alone. Today, inshallah, after the prayer is concluded, we pray your sunnah and the awful. Uh, there's a brother who's going to be taking a shahada, so if you can be a part of that, please do. And then just lastly, uh, next Juma will be Sheikh Zahib Webb's last Juma here as part of our staff. Uh, he's going to be moving to Maryland, as we mentioned some weeks ago, to be closer to family. As mashallah, they recently welcomed their second child. And so we'll have lunch next Friday, but if you can be here to also say farewell to him, to be a part of just thanking him for the time he served our community. A lot of people have asked if it's okay to to get gifts for the baby. You definitely can get gifts for the baby. When Medina was born, our first child, we didn't have to get clothes for her for the first three years of her life. <laughs> we just kept giving her stuff. It's amazing. <laughs> to try to come and say farewell to him that you don't know how great it is to have community that checks in and appreciates those who serve. So inshallah, He'll be here next Friday, uh, giving the clip up. It'd be great if we can show him some love before he, he heads out, inshallah. We hope you enjoyed our podcast. If you're inspired by the work that we're doing at the IC and want to help keep it going, subscribe to our podcasts, follow us on social media, donate to help support us at icnyu.org, and most importantly, keep us in your continued du'as. Until next time, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum.